Okay, and we are live. So um, welcome everyone. Um, we're live on Facebook, we're, li we're on Zoom. Uh, my name is Nikki Lopez. I'm the artist and curator for the Sankofa Arts Project for the L.A. Lee Meisel um, Community Center Project. And this is the Community Oral History of Sistrunk. So um, a little bit about this project. I'm working with the L.A. Lee YMCA as well as the Arts and History Ambassadors for the L.A. Lee YMCA to um, curate some of the art that's going to touch on some of the legacy of uh, Sistron Boulevard, in particular, uh, the Victory Theater, the Providence Hospital, the YMCA and the neighborhood, um, creating art that's going to go into the, the brand new LA Lee YMCA that's being built right now. And this is the second installment out of three virtual chats. So tonight we're going to be hearing, this is a merger of you know, using the traditional oral history and bring it into the current um, modern times using virtual space. And we're gonna be hearing from people who have um, been raised in Sistrunk, born in Sistrunk. And um, uh, we're gonna hear those stories today. So if you're on Facebook watching live and you have grown up in the Sistrunk area, please, uh, you know, use the Zoom call to the Zoom code to log into the Zoom so you could be a part of this, uh, this moment and share this space so we could learn, we could learn from each other, we could reflect. And um, this is going to be recorded, it will be on YouTube as well as a podcast as well as um, submitted to be archived. So this is a part of a historic moment for uh, the Broward community, for the Sistrunk community, for the YMCA. So I, I'm just going to take um, a brief moment. We do have several of the ambassadors, the history and art ambassadors. So I'm going to ask if um, we could just kind of popcorn, I'll call your name just to say, you know, your name, a, a, a quick introduction, just so you all could be acknowledged and then just call on someone else. And then we will pass it over to the guest poet, and then we'll start our program. So um, if we could start with uh, Miss Odessa, can, um, well, uh, I'm sorry, was Miss Odessa, yeah, well, she's part of the, the program. So yes, if everyone is a small, a small group of us, so we could just start to say, you know, our name, just a little line and um, as an introduction. Good evening, everyone. I'm Odessa Striggles Bennett, a product of the 33311, raised on Northwest 5th Avenue and Northwest 6th Street, which is now Sistrunk Boulevard. A lot of history. Thank you. Anyone else? So you just kind of jump in. Uh, Lorraine Mizell, business owner on the corridor at Sistrunk, um, born at Dixie Court Project. Proud Dick's accordion, <laughs> um, raised in um, Fort Lauderdale by Ivory Mizell and Vera Mizell, my father and mother. And I'm happy to be part of the YMCA and whatever it's doing. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Mary Russ Milligan. I am uh, the granddaughter of Raleigh Feldemore, one of the oldest newspapers in Broward County for colored people. And I'm also a family member of Dr. Sistrunk, little known history facts that will soon be revealed as well. So I grew up on Northwest 23rd Avenue, the same street that Dr. Sistrunk lived on, which was our family community area off of Sit Street. So you know, it's just a pleasure to be here and be able to share our family history and also be a part of the YMCA. I'm so grateful for the YMCA to put this project together. So it's so important for our community. And it's so good to see more and more uh, community uh, members connecting with our group. And I have gotten a lot of good feedback. So I must say we are doing positive things. Thank you, for Nikki, for all the work that you do. Thank you, no problem, appreciate that. Anybody else, anybody else ready? Hi, 
Yes. <laughs> I'm Lillian Small. I was born and reared right here in Fort Lauderdale. As a matter of fact, I'm one of Dr. Sistrunk's thousands of babies that he delivered right here in Fort Lauderdale. My parents were Isaac and Rosalie Small, and there were four of us children in the family, two girls, two boys. Uh, when I went away to school, I went to school in Virginia at Hampton University. And of course, there's no place like home. So I returned home and I've been here ever since. I've had the opportunity of working at Provident Hospital. I've had the opportunity of working at the uh, Victory Theater. I've had the opportunity of being on the board at the YMCA. I've had the opportunity of being a part of the opening cer ceremony when the hospital plus whatever else came all in between Provident Hospital became a library. So when it opened as a library, I was a part of that opening celebration. Yes, I'm very happy to be here and to have been a part of all of these things. And I wanna be a part of a whole lot of other things that we are embarking upon. It's just so wonderful to have lived this long in one place and to have seen the amount of growth that has happened here. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Nikki, for what you do. Absolutely, I'm so happy to have you here. Anyone else, anyone else? Intros, intros, we have Madeline, um, Scott, Gabe, anyone, you know, we're... Hi, <laughs> I'm, I'm Scott. I wasn't born in Cistrunk, um, but I am a proud member of the Art and History Committee for the Y and also a proud member supporter of the Trailblazers of Broward and uh, just a big fan of history um, and a big fan of the Cistrunk community. I'm just humbled to be here with the elders tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Gabe. <clears throat> actually, I don't know if uh, some of you know, I'm actually originally from Venezuela. I came to the United States uh, probably 24 years ago. Um, I love this community. I've been meeting so many people and so many of you throughout the years. And I have learned so much and I keep loving my job every single day, keep uh, loving meeting all of you and participating in things like this. Um, obviously I can't do any of that uh, from where I'm from, but then is I feel like I've been adopted um, a little bit um, through the hearts of the people in this community. So I'm super excited. Thank you, thank you. Any other intros? Oh. Hi, um, I'm Madeline. I was here. Sorry, I was just trying to make space for all you guys. I'm here to listen. I've grown up in Fort Lauderdale my whole life. And when Nikki told me what you guys were doing tonight, I'm very excited to be here and listen to all of your stories. So that's what I'm here for. Thank you. And we have Miss Gloria. We're just doing a quick intro before we start the program. So if you want to like, just say a quick uh, who you are, um, we'll get into the story part, but uh, yeah, if you could uh, say hello and say a quick who you are. So you want me to give you a little introduction of myself? Yeah, we'll, we'll have some time for the story, but oh, yeah. You made it. <laughs> okay, my name is Gloria Robinson, and I was uh, born and raised here. Well, I was raised in Fort Lauderdale, and uh, I've been here for almost 80 years old <laughs> here in Fort Lauderdale. Two more and, days. Um, and I'm a member of the Trailblazers of Broward County, and... Um, I think this is concerning, and this is my first time on, but uh, I think Lillian explained it to me about the history of the YMCA. Am I understanding this? 
Well, yeah, this is a part of the project, but tonight we're here to, you know, hoping that you all that grew up, born, raised, grew up in this area can share some of your stories, some of your personal history. So um, this is a part of the YMCA project, but this is us, you know, learning from the community and this is the community coming and having a space to be heard and to share you know something that they feel is important something they feel is their legacy something they feel that they want to contribute whether it's your personal family or just something growing up in the cis trunk area so okay yeah well i i guess you know i've been here in fort lauderdale all my life so uh, and being a part of the community, we were very, very involved in the YMCA from the beginning. And uh, I remember the Y Gray Dell, and uh, uh, we were always involved, especially on a Saturday night with the sock hop. And I think this was uh, one of the uh, opportunities that we were able to have uh, 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 introduced to a lot of the uh, entertainers. Um, and uh, we were always on, especially on a Saturday night, that was our sock hop and we were, you know, always dancing and having fun. And I was a member of the Y Gray Dell and uh, we had meetings and and we had other activities, you know, and I remember that we used to have, I think the uh, ping pong tournament with most of the guys, we didn't do that much of, uh, with those uh, um, uh, games and things that we played, but most of the guys did. So, do. Thank you, thank you for sharing. And Terry, we're just getting, we're about to start, but we're just doing a quick intro of, you know, who you are and we're gonna, um, then we're gonna turn it over to Rebecca Butterfly and then we're gonna get into um, the storytelling. Hi, hi, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Terry Lynn Hankerson. I'm the daughter of Dr. Gwendolyn Louise McCord Hankerson. My father is Tommy Lee Hankerson. My mother was born in Fort Lauderdale in 1931. My father, he came in from Georgia in the early 30s as well. Um, I've lived my entire life in Fort Lauderdale, Broward County. Grew up right off Sixth Trunk, Sixth Trunk and 12th Avenue where my father had a gas station and it eventually turned into a um, car wash um, auto mechanic. My grandmother owned all the property that was behind there next to Walker Grocery and a few other places. Right now, I'm currently employed with Broward County School Board as a security specialist. I work at Cypress Run Educational Center. Thank you, thank you. And I, I think, um, Tara, did you want to introduce yourself? Uh, I think everybody kind of went. Um, so, okay, maybe we're just, a, so what I'm gonna do, I'm going to open up this space for Rebecca to kind of uh, bless the space. She's an amazing poet that I don't even know. I think I've known, I've met Rebecca easily probably 15 years ago. <laughs> I was shooting, um, uh, I was shooting a, 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 a baby shower and she was the poet and it's just, you know, been a pleasure to always have her and work with her. And I know some of you may be familiar with her. Uh, she's done several um, poetry events in the Cis Trunk area in the YMCA. So I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca and then we're going to start. And what I'm going to do is as people speak, I'm going to try to highlight, you know, so we could just kind of put everyone front and center. And um, thank you. Let me put up here. So Rebecca. How you doing, everybody? It was Hi. definitely a pleasure Hi. listening to everyone. And it's interesting, you know, life is full circle or we all have that particular name of a person. I actually grew up with uh, Odessa in my, um, in my life. And so it was kind of like sentimental listening to Miss Odessa speak and say that she, you know, is from the Cistrunk area of Fort Lauderdale. 
Sankofa, Sankofa, Sankofa. I love the introspect of conversation when someone is not aware of what something may be and I get to share what it is. I remember having a conversation and someone asked, what is Sankofa or what is the Sankofa bird? Basically, it's the essence of looking back, but also looking forward. You see, that's just it. You have to sometimes look back in order to know which direction you're going to be going forward. As much as people say, forget about the past. No, you can never forget about the past. The past is going to always be with you, kind of like the shadow. It's an essence of you. So why would you want to forget it? Even though some situations and scenarios may allow for you to want to regret some things, but at the end of the day, everything is always happening and moving in a particular stride that is necessary. When's the last time you had a conversation with pops or moms in the corner store? And they told you just how long that particular convenience store has been in the neighborhood or how long they have been coming to that particular store in the neighborhood. And they literally could break down everything of the dynamics of even the decor and how originally when they used to first walk through the door, the counter was on the right as opposed to now being on the left. And in the back was this and on the side was that. And I remember they used to sell these particular candies that I like or better yet potato chips that they don't even sell anymore i'm pretty sure it would be hard for me to find them but see nothing really ever dies out it continues to live even individuals after they have gone as long as your name is continued to be spoken you will still continue to be living beautiful i love the stories oral history it does something to my bones in fact something to my flesh better yet tickled up my spine turns my spine into like the mcdonald's art sign especially when i'm talking to an elder that's like 95 years old but still got pep in his step or she got swag in her walk or just the way that she dressed or better yet her mind state is sharper than a lead to pencil and all you want to do is just soak up and soak in everything that she or he is telling you about the history of the neighborhood, about the history of the city, about the history of the state. Because see, ain't nothing like hometown. You can do all the traveling you want to. You can go from city to city and state to state. But one of you spoke and said it best, ain't nothing like home. Mm. Is that it? <laughs> You got it. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much, uh, um, Butterfly, for sharing that. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing they, like home. Yes, yes. So we're here. There's no order. Does anyone want to be the first storyteller to take some time and share a story? If you got some photos or memorabilia, um, that's all good too. Well, I, I think I'll start. No, okay. I'll be after you, Lillian. Okay. Oh, I want to tell you about uh, in the late 40s. Nowadays, they, they have a Bible school. Every church has its own Bible school. But in the late 40s, when I was a youngster, all of the kids at school attended Bible school in one place. And that was on 2nd Street and 4th Avenue at what was Piney Grove Baptist Church. And I do have a picture, but not available with me tonight. It's a huge picture. And I, I wasn't sure whether I would be able to share the screen with it and even how much you would have been able to see it because everybody on that picture represented every kid that was here in Fort Lauderdale at that time. School was out, the minute school is out, first thing we did was go to Bible school over at Piney Grove Baptist. And we stay there 
not like they have it today. And at the end of the Bible school, we all went to the Indian reservation as a field trip every year. It was a wonderful feeling. It was like, oh my goodness, school is out. Friday, school is out. Next week is Bible school. Are you going to Bible school? Sure, everybody was there. And when you look at that picture, which I'm sure all of you will get a chance to see at some point, not tonight, of course, you will see a lot of people on that picture. Some you might even recognize uh, octogenarians right now. And some of, some of them are probably nonagenarians, but <laughs> septogenarians. Mm -hmm. But we were all there. Every kid who went to school here went to Piney Grove Baptist. Now, Piney Grove Baptist is no longer there. It's First Baptist and it's over on Oakland Park Boulevard, but there is a marker over in that area. I don't know how many people are aware of that, but that if you're going to the Kentucky Fried Chicken right off of Second Street and Broward, uh, down Fourth Avenue, you will see the marker where Piney Grove Baptist Church was. It was a wonderful experience and we all enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, uh, as I said earlier, am Odessa Striggles Bennett, one of the Striggles family members, and it's a lot of us here. So, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> I was, I was, I moved here when I was about nine, eight or nine years old, and um, we moved to Northwest. Fifth Avenue, where we lived a number of years, where I grew up, where we had so much fun. The Victory Theater was on the end of Northwest 6th Street, uh, 5th Avenue, at uh, 6th Street and 5th Avenue. It was the center of our entertainment. Uh, it was uh, one of the places that we went when we wanted to go see a movie or when we wanted to to go see uh, entertainers, but I wasn't old enough to do that, but that was what uh, happened at the Victory Theater. A lot of the famous um, uh, singers or whatever came to the theater. Then on Saturdays, they would show movies at the theater, the um, uh, 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 cartoons and uh, the, different, the different things that we were able to look at. And, and uh, on Christmas, we would always get a pair of skates, the skates that had the key. And uh, if you didn't get a pair of skates or a, a bike or whatever, you know, you, you just felt like you were out of, the, out of the loop. But we'd always go down near uh, the Victory Theater and skate and do whatever. Fifth Avenue was the, like the Harlem Renaissance. Everything and anything that you wanted was on Fifth Avenue, starting from the Victory Theater. When you came down from Sixth Street all the way to Second Street, you had uh, the uh, clubs you had, and everything was black owned. You had the clubs, you had the uh, uh, stores that sold uh, uh, good clothing goods. You had the dry cleaners, you had the uh, drugstore on the corner, you had the taxi stand, you had the, um, the uh, restaurants, black owned restaurants. You had the barber shop, the beauty shop. You had the church that I grew up in uh, when we first moved here was uh, St. John. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, there was some feedback. So. Was St. John United Methodist Church. It was a two story building on Fifth Avenue, and we attended that church. and. We had some great times there. Um, after a number of years, the church caught fire and um, we moved to the uh, YMCA on 14th Terrace where we had services until the church uh, was built where it is today on uh, 15th uh, Terrace, I think it is. And um, that was a, a great, great time. Everybody was 
knew everybody. Everybody helped each other. Everybody was family. We had the, we called it the wash house, but it's the, the laundromat was on uh, Fifth Avenue. The funeral home uh, uh, was on, on Fifth Avenue. Uh, the the uh, employment office, uh, Miss Sylvia Aldridge employment was right around the corner, you know, and she tried to make sure that she helped uh, those who wanted to work or was looking for work. She tried to help everybody. We had the church on the corner, Mr. Um, Reverend Gooden and his wife, and they are still living today. I think they're about 90 something years old. And uh, and Miss um, uh, Harris, Savannah Harris, and all those different people that uh, are part of my culture, a part of my fabric, a part of the, the uh, history that makes me who I am today, uh, because everybody was so proud and so uh, honored to be uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and, you know, we always made sure that we took care of each other and uh, the older members took care of uh, the children in the neighborhood. If you did something wrong and, and your and your uh, mom found out about it or one of the uh, older uh, women told your mom or whatever, you can just know for sure that you were gonna get, <laughs> you were gonna get it when they got home. And it wasn't a, a, a thing where um, the other older uh, adult could not chastise you or say anything to you. We respected our elders and we were very proud of that. I attended Walker Elementary School, which is now the old Dillard Museum. And I'm very uh, excited about that place because um, I'm a part of that as, as the old Dillard Foundation. I'm the president for the old Dillard Foundation and we're in collaboration with Old Dillard Museum, where uh, we're gonna, after you know, things kind of cool down, open back up to the community and and, and work with Walk Elementary, which has now uh, under the auspices of Walk Elementary. But it was a place uh, where we had a lot of fun. Everybody went either Walk Elementary or Dillard or whatever, and across the street was um, Dixie Court. Everybody I knew uh, mostly lived on in, in Dixie Court or whatever. We had friends everywhere. And as Lillian said, there was Piney Grove on the corner. And, and that was a place where uh, we uh, often frequented as, you know, uh, going to church services and Mount Olive, which was right on the corner and everything. It was in a, a little Mecca. After we moved off of Fifth Avenue, I, I moved to Sixth Street. We lived right next door to a place called Little Joe. It was a, a nightclub, but um, you know that didn't phase us because it was still a community. We had families who owned uh, stores that lived next to uh, next to us, and uh, uh, down the street we had all the different grocery stores. And then eventually, uh, my family and I we we joined my mom who was a member of Mount Nebo Missionary Baptist Church, which was down 6th Street. We had the fish markets down 6th Street, Walker Grocery Store, all the way down, you know, uh, Mizell's, the Provident Hospital. I mean, it was it's such history. And I just really am excited about the opportunity to be a part of this because I would like to see our history remembered even though some of it has been lost we can still regain it and as we're doing now with the storytelling and you know uh, uh making sure that it's it's uh in, engraved in in history to be remembered because it's so much history that we need to make sure that that is remembered because it is the fabric of fort lauderdale uh i remember we stayed on this side of uh, the railroad track, we had to go across the railroad track to go downtown, uh, which is on Andrews Avenue to uh, all the stores. Uh, we had the um, uh, 
what was the name of the store, Lillian? The 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 uh all of the the stores where we would buy clothes for Easter. We had layaway and that kind of thing, and it was it was just so great to be a part of that era to me. And when I look at our children uh, today, I just I don't know. I think they probably think they're having fun or whatever. But even though we were, uh, uh, when I started out, we were uh, uh, segregated, uh, it it didn't matter. We were family. When I went to school, my teachers were genuinely concerned about my education and concerned about me and concerned about whether we learned or whatever. And I just sometimes don't see that happening now. It's, I think the, a lot of the teachers' hands are tied and whatever, so uh, they can't do what they want to do. And then they, they've gotten, some of them have gotten to the point where, you know, it's just a paycheck. And I just feel so sad because I um, retired from the uh, private sector uh, with Bell South and I substitute teach because I wanted to stay connected with the young people and so forth. And I try to save whoever I can and the ones that I can't, you know, I just pray for them. But um, uh, the uh, 1959, 1960, uh, when I came here in 1957, that era on up has just been a blessing to my life. And you know, sometimes you can uh, think that we didn't even know we were poor, but uh, I, I know by by uh, American standards, I'm sure we were, because we had the government cheese, the you know things that we couldn't afford, but we didn't know we couldn't afford them because my mom made sure that we ate. She made sure that all nine of her children were taken care of. My dad died when I was five, so. Uh, she took care of all of us. She's uh, as one of the very proud, one of the very strong black women that I look up to because she's a part of my uh, black history. And I just, you know, applaud all the people and the women and the uh, entrepreneurs and the uh, uh, people who made it during that time because it wasn't easy, but we made it. So sometimes when we have struggles now, it's not new to us because, you know, I've been there. So I know how to survive. I could go on and on about Sixth Street and Fifth Avenue and uh, I just on and on. Dillard High School, the whole nine yard. And out uh, uh, to this day, I'm an avid Dillard High School fan because that was in our blood. And, you know, we weren't bus to school. We had to walk. I lived on Fifth <laughs> Avenue, but I had to walk to Dillard High School when it was time for me to go to Dillard High School and walk through um, the cemetery over there on 19th Street. What's the name of it, Lillian? Uh, <laughs> uh, Woodlawn. <laughs> Woodlawn. Woodlawn Cemetery. Woodlawn. Yeah. Yes, we had to walk across Sunrise, go to Villa <laughs> High School, and didn't complain. None of these kids don't even want to get on the bus. So you know, it's just I, I appreciate my my history. I appreciate you know the fact that we had to work for what we wanted. Everything just wasn't given to us because we had to earn it, and we appreciated it more because we had to earn it. And uh, I just really think that, I just wish that we could, some of those values were still here. I know some of them are, but a lot of them we got away from, but um, our, our stories need to be told. Okay, I'll let the next person go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. And then Nothing we left to be said. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, and just let me take a moment because we have we're live on Facebook and we have a couple people joining on Facebook. We have I just want to send a shout out and acknowledge. Uh, we have Deborah Kerr saying hello. Kim J saying hello, everyone. Roosevelt saying hello. 
Uh, we have Grecia from Femin Africa uh, saying greetings. Thank you, Nikki, for bringing all the wonderful guests together and looking forward to listening to the stories and experiencing experiences and keeping such rich legacy alive. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kim Ray uh, Mizell Hill saying hello to everyone. So I just want to make sure that we are acknowledging everyone and please if you, um, I know Dr. Kim Ray was on the other call, but you know, if you feel moved to share some more stories, please hop on to the Zoom. Um, so, and if you're in the Cistrunk area, you know, and you need the Zoom link, I could post it again. So let me know. Um, so who else is next? Who's next? Well, I guess I'll tell my little story next. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the most important thing that I remember growing up, of course, is the photo studio. That's where I got my work, work ethic, where I work like a dog now, constantly, because I worked in the studio so much from the time I could stand up and click a camera. I must have was 10 years old when my dad would leave the photo studio and say, anybody come in and want a picture? He taught me how to snap it. This lady said one time, do you know what you're doing, little girl? <laughs> I snapped the picture. It came out fine. He taught us at an early age, and I was up there every day uh, with my sister when we weren't in school. We'd work from 9 to 4 o'clock. Uh, he taught us how to go in the dark room for hours and develop. Easter was the mega day. The line was out the door down the street. I bet anybody that grew up here had a photo taken on Easter Sunday. Uh, that's one of my big fond memories. Another one is, of course, well, not of course, but another one is going to the beach when we got a break. And I remember the hot sand and the pale metal rods and bushes that we had to pass through to get to um, the beach that we were allowed to go to, and that was up around um, North Broward, I think around Delray, uh, Deerfield area. And we'd have to grow, go through the hot sand to get a long walk to get to the river, uh, get to the beach, but it was fine. I, you know, we were happy. Oh, it was the beach, it didn't matter. But then that was taken away from us because I heard that the land was purchased and we no longer could go there to that beach. So we were, were without a beach to go to. All of that beach along the Florida coast and the blacks couldn't go swimming. Our best thing was a water hose in the front yard and put the water hose on and keep it up and dance on it. Well, we were kind of happy with that, but but then Dr. Bell thought that we should be able to go to the beach. So then we had, of course, uh, the wait-ins. That stands out in my memory, even though I was um, my age now. Those two things I remember most of all in my life, the studio and, of course, it's like a landmark for Fort Lauderdale. Anybody growing up, I'm sure, had a picture taken there and that beach era. And Dr. Mizell at one point thought we should do a, a wait in. And uh, he asked uh, my father if he could take me and my sister out there on the beach. This was uh, summer 62, I think it was, 62. And uh, that was uh, the first that I know of to integrate the beach. And after that, um, Eula Johnson took a lot of teenagers to the beach that summer until it was finally integrated. Of course, there's another story about the, the Lloyd uh, Beach over in Dania, where finally to keep us off of Los, uh, Los Olas and A1A, they uh, gave us that land over there, but then you couldn't get to it with a car you had to get on a boat and the boat would hold you so many people. Mm -hmm. So if you were left over there with the sun setting, you were a uh, mosquito bait. Those are some of the biggest mosquitoes over there I've ever seen. They were blood suckers. 
So the boat would take some back and go in and pick up some until everybody was off. And we did that for a while until finally uh, they built a road that would give us better access to the beach. Well, I think we know all of the history of that. Turns out a few years ago, what, four years ago, maybe or four or five years ago, the beach was renamed for Dr. Mizell and Eula Johnson, which by right, it should have been. Because before that, I think um, Lloyd was the uh, lawyer that um, worked on the case with the road being built. I don't know why they picked him to name it from, but who knows what. Anyway, that's my little short version of my growing up, the two things that stand out most. The studio and the beach. I end my history. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Laureen. Okay, I'll go next. Mm -hmm. I'm Gloria Robinson, Gloria Carter Robinson. Oh. And uh, I didn't think any, I hadn't heard anyone mention about the ice house that was located just before you get to the railroad track. And uh, uh, that was one of the places where I think we had Mr. Anderson, who was uh, the delivery man, and uh, he would deliver the ice. I think it was like on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I think at that time, the, the ice a block was about 50 cents. And he would come every Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. And also, I remember the milkman. In that time, during that time, we always had milk, and the milkman delivered the milk on Mondays and Fridays. Um, also, I want to talk about, and that was the area where I lived, up on Fifth Avenue. I mean, Sixth Avenue and Second Street, on the corner there, where my grandparents owned their land. And uh, down the street, it was the hotel, I mean, Odell's. And on the corner of 2nd Street and 5th Avenue was my husband's uh, family uh, gas station, Moe's McCoy. And um, along 5th Avenue, they had, I don't know if anybody remember Mr. McDonald. He was a tailor and he used to make get the straps from all everybody that went to them to have a suit uh, made, he would take the material and use it. And during the Chris, I mean, the Easter holidays, he would like have like a fashion show. And uh, also um, on that street was Benton's Funeral Home. And we had Mr. Joe uh, and Marie um Bethel they had a, a a grocery store and I don't know if everybody remember the half loaves that they used to get used to sell it was 16 cents a loaf but we were able to uh buy the half loaves Marita uh company had the half loaves where they had the the uh uh the uh the bread would be uh, divided, you can buy a half loaf or a whole loaf. And my mama would always send us over there to get a half a loaf of bread and she would always dice it up in order to, you know, make us sandwiches and things. And I also want to talk about uh, um, uh, Jerry Hill, Dorothy Duncans, uh, Mrs. Upshaw, those were the grocery stores around our school and, and uh, 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 over near Mrs. Ruby Watson's nursery in that area. And Dorothy Duncan's where everybody hung out uh, when they wanted to play hooky and didn't want to go to class. Uh, and especially at church, we used to leave from church Sunday school and then we'd have our little you know, nickels and dimes, instead of putting it in church, we go to Dorothy Duncan's and buy us, I think it was the hot dogs and Mrs. Upshaw had the lead bread and the red soda water. And Mr. Jerry Hill, he had all the little candies, 
He was next. He was in the same building where Mrs. Ruby Watson uh, was at that time, and that's where we went to uh, kindergarten. And uh, um, there was so much fun, and we didn't have like a, a, a park to go through, but we had more fun, walk, especially during the summer, because what we had for food was uh, mangas, mullets, and guavas. And we lived, uh, we didn't go in, in the house for a uh, uh, break for lunch or anything. Whatever was in our yard with the fruits and things, we ate it. And it, we had fun eating the mangoes and, and the guavas and the, the uh, uh, all kind of fruits, mulberries. My grandmother had all kind of mulberries and things. And also the church we had, it was the um, Church of God in Christ. And uh, we, we lived right next to the church and uh, looked like they would have church, Reverend Curry and those would have, Bishop Curry and those would have church every night. And we get out there and shout just as much as they did. We were in the yard shouting and they were inside the church shouting. But, uh, uh, and on Sixth Avenue, um, they had the, uh, uh, what was that? The grocery store on 4th and 6th. They had New York Market. They had the, uh, um, what was that? The cleaners. And my uncle, he had the first uh, bowling alley on 5th Avenue, uh, Pete Sundry. And my uncle had a restaurant around the corner next to the drugstore. <clears throat> but uh, it was just really beautiful growing up because everybody in the neighborhood had lots of fun. And um, mm -hmm. also Ruby oh. Watson. Ruby Watson was the, the nursery for e everybody. Every child in the neighborhood looked like Ruby Watson. Mm -hmm. uh, they went to Ruby Watson. And we went from Ruby Watson to uh, the school right across the street. And uh, down six, down six, well, what they call Sistrant now, but down the Sixth Street, we had Jim Drennan's grocery store, Walker grocery store, and they were all mom and pop grocery store. All the businesses in our neighborhood were owned by um, family members. And uh, um, I remember when we used to have what they called the uh, when you go to the grocery store, you put uh, 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 everything on layaway and come once a week, they would pay the bills. Um, and I think that's about all for right now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I'll go now, Nikki, if I may. Let me see. Let me go. Who is that? Is that Miss Mary? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, okay. I am Mary Russ Milligan, a born native by Dr. Sistra to a twin, Martha Russ Adams. And I grew up on Northwest 23rd Avenue. I attended Walker Elementary School as a youngster, Sunland Park, Lincoln Park, and all of those schools in that area. And of course, still at high school and New River when they uh, integrated the schools. But I want to start out by mentioning some of the family names. And most of my family were actually on the west side of the railroad track. And where Dr. Sistrunk lived, and most of our family, as I said, my grandfather sold a lot of that property. And he was a realtor, as well as a newspaper man and a concessionaire. So he would sell property to the family. Mm -hmm. So most of them kind of gathered no. around each other. Oh, really? And they came from the Panhandle and around the Quincy, uh, Midway, Tallahassee area. Actually, Dr. Campbell, who was a family member, there's a lot of history on him. 
He's in Tallahassee. He was in Tallahassee. A street is named after him. In fact, his daughter, Alpha Campbell, married Von D. Mizell, married Von Mizell. Uh, Raleigh Moore, who was my great great grandfather, of course, we talked about him quite a bit. Uh, also in that area, we had um, we had the Hunter family and the Daltrey family. Uh, Donaldson Daltrey, who was my uncle, he built, I would say, from Sixth Street, where Ivory's um, Ivory Shop is, which was all family land at one time. In fact, where I played on the mango tree is where the fence is, where Ivory's property is right now where they have that fence around it. My father bought that when he was actually in the military. So along that entire east side of 23rd Avenue was my family plantation. As you continue on down 23rd Avenue, you would go along down the riverfront area where the sea cows were, and all the kids would stop down by the apartments and play with the sea cows. As we worked our way around the corner, going to uh, cousin Sistrunk area, which is where the peacocks were. So he had so many beautiful peacocks that roamed that entire street. So you know when you got to Dr. Sistrunk's house because there was all the beautiful peacocks and you know just a beautiful thing to see. So those were some very important people that uh, lived on that side. And of course, when you cross on the opposite side of, of Sist Street, and 27th Road, uh, there was our family, the Chisholms. The Chisholms, we had the barbecue stand there. And across the street was the Blue Goose. And of course, the Chisholms had a bus stop that we would catch the bus stop from when we changed from Dr. Sistrunk's home. We caught the bus, uh, bus stop at the barbecue pit. So Family was just all over the place and we're so connected and so grounded. And it's just um, like, this is so important because there's just so much history that a lot of people don't even know about including the Grays. Those were uh, family members also, which were on the west side of the track. Um, see who else was there. Uh, you had the Mike Elvey, Clyde Mike Elvey. Some of you may remember Clyde Mike Elvey. He was one of the first mechanics in, in Broward County. Uh, so there was a lot of history behind him. Now, we're going to get off of 23rd Avenue and go down to 5th Avenue. 5th Avenue was really the place, like everybody said, was the place to be. That's where we had Aunt Tansy and... Um, my other aunts and the beauty salon connected to my father and Avant barbershop. And um, that's where I would have to stay there as a little girl. If my mom wanted to go across the street to the Windsor Club or my father just had to keep us until we go down to the Victory Theater when someone would come by and take us. So Fifth Avenue was also an area that I look forward to going to. In fact, you will see, I sent pictures in for Easter dresses. Those Easter dresses were taken at Mizell Studio in 1965. And we look forward to Easter. Easter was really big in Fort Lauderdale during that time. And we used to always have a little parade and the Fifth Avenue parade. And we were saying on the avenue, Fifth Avenue. So I really missed that. And that's why I, you know, I, it was so broken hearted when they took Fifth Avenue away from us. And I, I really think they should give it back. I keep saying that, but I really think they should. But, you know, so when we, we talk about you know, history, those are the kind of things that connect and, and bond us for a lifetime. And we just can't, we can't erase them. I can remember the times as the gangs would go down Sis Street. If you were coming from the west side of the track and you were coming to the east side, so you need to come from 23rd Avenue to get to 5th Avenue to go to the Victory Theater, you're going to meet some gangs coming down Sis Street. So a lot of the children that lived over near the Dillard area, they weren't even allowed to go that way because of the gangs during that time. And there was also this, um, this river rat gang, a gang they called the river rat. And we had this guy they used to call One-Eyed Nick. 
And he is history. A lot of people don't talk about Nick, but he is history. His family is history. And I, I, I'm wanting to bring more and more out, but there's just a lot of things. And I see Miss Small li looking up like, okay. But anyway, so there's just so many things that we have to talk about. And I am going to say, for one thing, one church I used to enjoy, I, I grew up in the Church of Christ, of course, with my father's side of the family. And then when I went with my mother, I had to go to the apostolic, which was holiness. Then with my grandpa, uh, they were Seventh-day Advantage. So in fact, the Seventh-day Advantage Church on 15th Avenue is property that my grandfather Raleigh Moore gave to that church. So a lot of people are not aware of that. So there's just so much uh, stories that are untold that we really need to get out. So I'm just so grateful again. And um, oh, one other thing, I haven't heard anyone mention the fact about the LPNL behind the Victory Theater. The LPNL was behind the Victory Theater, and um, that was another story to tell. So there's many stories to tell, and we can go on and on. So I will rest my case. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Who else would like to go up? Anybody else? Hey, I would just like to ask her when she mentioned one eyed Nick, he wasn't violent. It was just something mentally wrong. I'm with sorry. Him, correct? One eyed yeah, Nick, he wasn't Nick. violent. He wasn't violent. He just was mentally ill, right? No, he wasn't. He wasn't violent at all. The only thing is, oh, you I know, when you he said he was the Excuse me. Oh. Excuse yeah. me, please. Oh. <laughs> Nick, <laughs> I love me until uh, Nick, Nick, Nick is in my family. His name is Henry Moore. Right. He was severely burned as a child in right. Georgia. No, he was not violent. Not, uh, he was he was uh, shot away from people because of the disfigurement mm -hmm. that he sustained by being severely burned. And right. the kids used to pick at him and throw rocks at him and everything. But uh, Nick was a very calm person. Yes, he was. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I first met him, he was coming into my house with my uncle and I did not know at that time that there was a relationship. So my uncle was saying, well, you know, Nick, so-and-so-and-so and he still got plenty of relatives around here, the Moors. And uh, Nick would shy away, he, he likes to, you know, he would turn his face away from you because he knew that he was disfigured. But no, he was a very calm person. And once he got used to me being calm with him, he was okay. You know, he would come with my uncle and I, Nick, you know, hi. But, you know, he was still shy away, but, uh -huh. you know, he got used to, to me. But anyway, he's in my family. And what I, used to happen was on the last day of school, we could not wear red or white because the river rats, they would, um, they would say either uh, one I did was gonna run you or the river rats, but it was really the river rats who was the gang. It wasn't one I Nick. One I Nick would run the children when they picked at him, only when they picked at him, but he was like Miss Small said, he was a person that minded and you know, I heard he was a very handsome man before the, the family, the house burned up, so. I, you know, that's, I really would like to know a lot more and about, you know, him and the family. I would well, he too. Still got, he still got family around here. Mm -hmm. And you might even know some of them if I were to call their name at some other time, but not now. Anyway, uh, yeah, he was a very docile person. And he just stayed to himself. He walked real fast because he wanted right. to get away from people and he would turn his face in a different direction when he would see people, but still kids would pick at him, you know. Mm -hmm. My sister and I were terrified of him. Terrified. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just a phobia with us. It was a, 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 a bad phobia. Well, we absolutely to... nothing was wrong with him mentally. No, no, it wasn't, no. But I think it was the way, like, Nick would wear his pants, like, halfway his legs would grow yes, up. Right. And, yeah. and they would be jacked up. I think it was things like that that kind of scared the kids because we were coming from an elementary school and and it was, you know, so yeah. that kind of thing. But Well, who remembers Faustina? I do. I do, too. <laughs> what was that, Miss Small? Who remembers Faustina? Faustina, I do, yeah. Lorraine, you should, right? I, I do. do. I said I do, but I wasn't I know, I mean, but Paul somebody Cena. else is saying I do. Uh, Gloria. Uh, yeah. Oh, Gloria. Now, she did have a mental problem. But I, she didn't scare me, but Nick did. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I remember. I know her. I, in fact, she's in our Trailblazers, one of our Trailblazers member family, if I'm not, if I'm not miscorrect. Faustina? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh -huh. you one of your relatives, huh? Yeah, I, I, we, we have, you know, but we have a lot to talk about. Okay. All right. Well, we, we have people in our family that were sort of socially. You remember uh, Fred? No, what was his name? Henry? Henry? Oh, um, Nick? No, I say you remember Henry Stevens? Oh, yeah. He was a classmate of ours. And uh, uh, was that was that Fred, uh, the McNairs? And Ronnie. Yeah. The one that set the house on fire and went to the mental institution for a while. Yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie Payne. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to know if any of you remember the young lady, Marianne Matthews. She used to work for um, Izell Funeral Home years ago, and they found her. We were waiting for her to show up in church. She was the church secretary, and they found her in the house dead. This was in the 60s, early 60s. Mary Ann Matthews. Her boyfriend had choked her. Mary Ann Matthews, beautiful, beautiful lady. Nah. Mm -mm, don't remember. That was behind us. <laughs> So, see, we have, oh, I think Terry is coming in. <laughs> Hi, yes. Good evening. Terry Hankerson. Um, interesting stories. <laughs> some of them I kind of remember, but some of them I'm kind of young. So um, <laughs> we hung out a lot on 6th Trunk. Well, it was 6th Street for us. 6th Street and 12th is where uh, my grandmother and my father, my grandmother's home was on 6th Street and 12th. And my father Sister had his business. Allie. Yes, Allie King McCord. That's <laughs> correct. And my father had the, um, it was a gas station initially, and then it became his auto body shop and car wash, Hank and Sons, which was next to um, Walker Groceries across the street from the fish market. Um, and um, just coming on to um, share some of the things that I remember that I was told. Um, especially listening to my mother and my grandmother and their friends who are originally from Fort Lauderdale. And for those who don't know, my mother and her organization, the um, elders from the African-American Research Library wrote a book called Across the Tracks that um, depicted some of the oral histories um, of Broward County and um, they were in the works of putting a second edition together before she passed. So that never took place. But it's interesting because I was the typist of this book and it's in the library of schools of Broward County. And one of my students got a hold of the book. And you know, when you're typing, <laughs> it's a lot of stuff you don't remember, but when you sit down and you start reading the things, it amazed me, um, the love, um, the dignity, the heritage that the families had in Broward County. And just recently, this week, as a matter of fact, the school board of Broward County had a professional development class from the equity and diversification, which 
talked about African American history in Broward County. And um, if you know Jean Watts, one of her daughters, Elizabeth Libby, um, was one of the um, administrators of this class along with Marion Williams. And as I sat, because I think everybody was either from Day County or wherever else, um, there were a lot of things that they were not aware about of Broward County. Um, and I listened and it was like, you know, they talked about Provident Hospital and Dr. Sistrunk and of course, Dr. Von D. Mizell, but they never mentioned Dr. William Morris. And many people knew that Dr. Morris established his business on 6th Street as well. And right. I, like many, even though I had health insurance to go somewhere else, he would take me in. I could just walk in, give me a prescription, give me a shot and send me on my way. So um, that was just something I was listening to. I mean, they didn't even mention all of the Mizells that were busy in Broward County. Um, you know, everybody could, could name everything, but they still forgot about the main thing that we were talking about, which was the studio, you know, Mizell Studio. And I, I don't know anybody, any family from Broward County that didn't have one of those family photos with Mr. from that background. You just look at it and you know that was Mizell Studio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it, 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 we were so close. It, it, I mean, me as a kid, I, I, you know, 60s baby. But when I came along, my great grandfather, my um, great grandmother, Charlie King and Yuli King, um, were still around. My um, grandmother was around, Allie King McCord. But our heritage stretches long because my mother was a King and a McCord. And um, everybody know Reverend JC McCord um, from the church. So we couldn't understand why we were AME, but my mother had a, a, a strong heritage and a link to um, Piney Grove. And when I was listening earlier and they were saying, I think it was Miss Small who was mentioning how you had to go to Bible study, Bible school, even myself. We would leave Mount Hermon and Vacation Bible School was over there at um, First Baptist. And um, Alzora Goodrum, Miss Simmons, I mean, didn't play. And um, so it was like, we didn't say just because you either were at the Catholic church or you were at the Pentecostal church or whatever, we were a close knit family. Everybody looked out for everybody. And I always thought the main theme for the families in Broward County, especially on 6th Street, was the success of education. Yeah. I heard someone say at my mother's funeral, and I think it was Mary Alice Foster. My grandmother used to take the train to Maryland because the books were not fit for us here in Broward County. We didn't get the books like the white kids, so she would take a train to Maryland and bring everything back from Maryland and implement it here in Broward County. And my mother would be in the backyard on 6th Street and 12th Avenue teaching kids and getting them prepared. And she was just a kid, teaching kids and getting them prepared for school. And Mary Alice Foster, I'll never forget what she said. She said when it was time for her to go to first grade, she went straight to third grade because she was already prepared. Mm -hmm. So. I look at that nowadays because we take such, I don't think we take, I wouldn't want to say we take a disinterest in education, but education was always the key. Education was always the thing that pushed the families forward. I mean, when they shut down all the schools itself for Dillard, the families fought for Dillard to stay open. They wouldn't allow the kids to go to the bean fields and everything else. They kept them there and that's why Dillard, Ely, and a few other, the other school closed up. But Dillard stayed open so that our kids can get the education that they needed. The teachers were strong, strong. They taught you about how to dress, how to speak, 
how to carry yourself with dignity. So we didn't know that we were not rich. All of us thought we were rich and wealthy. Um, I, 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 when I finally got bused over to Nova during desegregation, um, I'm like the only kid, but only black kid in my class. And um, I'm going from where I was, <laughs> we had no white kids in my school. And so when you look at things that we have as far as our history, it's very important that we need to record it and keep it because a lot of kids nowadays are clueless about what happened. When you talk about black history, this month has been black history month. My school has said nothing about it except for mm -hmm. that it is black history month. But growing up, we had to know how to enunciate. We had oratorical contests. You had to be prepared. You had to learn. I learned Negro dialect when I was seven. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Nancy Hughes. We had to learn those things. We had to know them. And it was not just in the schools. It was in the church. It was, it was the next door neighbor. They'll catch you. You know, Terry Lynn Hankinson, what you doing? I mean, I was down there a couple of times but Miss Evelina knows over at my cell and she catch me. Did you did you learn that speech for Easter? And and I was so excited to learn that speech for Easter because I know when I got done, I was going over to the Elks so that I could show my outfit off in the Easter fashion show that they would have every year. So it's a lot of a lot of things. Um, you know, the Mizels, I I uh, we I mean, straight up, didn't play, you know. Uh, they would get on us like nobody business. I, I, my grandmother knew everybody in the neighborhood because she was on that quadrant. She had every kind of mango tree in her yard. And she would just pull them down and didn't have to worry about kids jumping on her yard to steal them because she put them out there in buckets in front of the street so that everybody could could sample and take whatever they needed. And that's how um, Sixth Street was. Um, I remember when the library was over in the building to, um, to the left of my grandmother. And um, you walk in one building and before they moved it over there where they're doing the work now. Um, so we always made sure that our kids were educated. We made sure our kids knew the importance of their heritage, their legacy. And we were so linked up with everybody. I mean, the Walkers, the Jacksons, um, we, we, we had to be linked up with those people because that built, made you proud about who you were. Even though I started at Dillard Elementary and then in the 70s, I got bussed over to Nova, Blanche Foreman. No, Nova Dwight D. Eisenhower I was at. My mother taught at Blanche Foreman. But during those days, that's when the Klan still would come out and march in the streets while I was sitting in the classroom to let me know I was not welcome. And I knew then I was not going to graduate from Nova. I knew that I was going to go to the illustrious Dillard High School. So after eighth grade, <laughs> Myself, Michelle Blanco, so you'll know, Michelle Blanco, <laughs> um, Gabe Tunnage, Dietra McCoy, all of us transferred from Nova Middle School to Dillard High School because we knew that's, that's what was in us since we were born. So Dillard was a mainstream, a main fixture of Broward County from dusk to dawn. My grandmother was a teacher at the all colored school and she would talk a lot of times about how, well, my mother used to always tell this story, but I couldn't believe it, how she had to walk 20 miles in the snow. When I said, mom, I don't ever remember it snowing in Fort Lauderdale except for my time. But I had to hear that story where, you know, uh, you better appreciate what, what you're getting because I had to walk 20 miles in the snow just to get my education. So <laughs> I'm just going to say that I love my history. I love 
what I learned, what I saw, the businesses that made me want to be better. Our businesses, you always saw the husband and the wife thriving in businesses. You know, if the husband had passed, like my grandfather had passed, my mother, my grandmother still continued to, to strive. She was the Allie McCord, who along with others sued the city of Fort Lauderdale for the single member districts in Broward County. So we knew that we had to fight to survive. In order to survive, we had to be educated because it was the key that opened many doors. And we never had this issue about being disrespectful. I didn't have to know you to look at you and see that you were my elder and I'm supposed to respect you and give you the honor. So I just wanted to say a few things this morning, this evening, to let you know that I'm a proud, proud child of my legacy. Charlie and Yuli King, my father, Tommy Lee Hankerson, the Hankersons, they moved over in Dixie Court when he came in from Georgia and they bought, built businesses. My father, he owned property. He um, opened up different shops, but he always tried to help others. You know, we never, they never got paid big money. My father would take kids when he had the opportunity because he got that piece of paper that said he can go on Fort Lauderdale Beach. So he'd pile up kids from the Northwest Quadrant in the back of his truck and take them, those who would never get the opportunity to see a beach to, so that they could be on Fort Lauderdale Beach. So I pre appreciate the legacy that's on the call this evening. Mm -hmm. Ms. Small, as you know, I love you. Jemima Heat Self, Ms. Gloria, same here, Ms. Mizell, Ms. Oh. Barnett. Love you guys. I appreciate all that you share. Please continue to push forward and remind the youngsters, like my little grandniece back here. <laughs> That's why she's here, so she can hear about our history. Because it's how we learn by listening and sitting at the foot of our elders and listen to the stories that they told of what they had to go through in order to survive. So thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to just jump into Facebook. We have Don from Afro Prize saying hello and great history. So uh, thank you for all who's on Facebook watching and uh, yeah, just loving and just soaking all this in. So um, anyone, I see we have uh, Milton, we have Kadian. Chikisha, Marquita, we have a couple people. Um, maybe, I don't know who else is, might be ready to share of you all just listening. Oh, let me see something. I would just uh, like to say that um, as I was watching the news yesterday, I uh, saw. Um, Miguel Pilgrim uh, on the news in reference to the revitalization of uh, Northwest 6th Street and uh, all of the buildings that we've been talking about today, uh, tonight rather, uh, were some of the, the buildings and some of the areas that he plans to, uh, you know, improve and bring uh, businesses to 6th Street and along with the YMCA and all the uh, Smitty's wings and all the other things that hopefully will uh, bring some light to Northwest 6th Street, which is the uh, Cistrunk Boulevard, the Cistrunk Corridor, as they call it. Uh, because I know a long time ago when I uh, remember the um, uh, CRA um, talking about the revitalization of Northwest Cistrunk Boulevard, um, it's gonna be like the Las Olas, but that never has happened. And it looks like it's taken a long, long time. I might not be alive to see it, but uh, when it happens, uh, I, I, I hope I'm here to see it. But um, 
it, it was a, a, a very uh, vital part of uh, the history in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, I'm glad that he took an interest in it with his winnings from his lottery to pour back into a community that I don't even think is his. He came from somewhere else. But uh, wherever he came from, I, I appreciate the fact that he's putting it into our community. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So any anyone else want to share a story or anything that came up? You know, any uh, anything you want to add to that? Okay. So this has been a beautiful, beautiful evening. If I do say so myself, I'm thanking everyone for being here, every story. Um, I, I'm just really grateful um, uh, to the Y for giving me this opportunity to create this and to create this with the history, um, the art and history group. Um, ambassador group that we, we've been working. We meet every two weeks and talk about different things. So um, just really um, honored to and happy to be um, in this space and taking in this knowledge. I'm not originally from uh, Broward County, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, you know, um, but this is my home. These are my roots. This is where my son is born. This is, you know, where I'm raising him and this is where I work and enjoy. And so I'm just really honored to be here and thanking everyone who shared a piece of history, a story. Um, I, you know, I, I'm glad we, there were some names that came up and then we all got it kind of situated. So I just love that, you know, um, but this is something that I hope that we can do more of. Um, this is definitely something that's, you know, taking that oral history, you know, bringing it into the virtual space, but also you know, this is also part of creating legacy, right? This can be um, submitted into archives. This could be something we can listen back. I think um, uh, Terry talked about her mom wrote a book, you know, of oral history. So, you know, that's something that someone can pick up that torch and um, at any time and build from that. So um, I see uh, Madeline, oh, thank for everyone sharing this history and thank you for open up the space, absolutely. Um, so I, I'm going to close it out. I, I do see we ha still have some people on Facebook. Um, please feel free to share this, you know, get help to get this history out there. Um, whether you're from Broward County or not, this is still relevant history. This is still Black history. This is still culture. This is still families. You know, there was someone that um, I think it was Terry talked about, you know, hearing um, an elder say, I used to walk 20 miles, no matter where you're at, right? That's kind of across the board that you're going to have someone saying, I walked through snow to get through this and you just pick up your iPhone. So, you know, these things, even though it is Broward County, it is the Cistrunk area, the Sixth Street area, that is the Fort Lauderdale area, it's still relative stories that connects to everyone. So I'm going to invite um, Rebecca uh, Butterfly back up to kind of close us out um, I did put in the chat. We have one more virtual chat. It is it's going to be Thursday, 630. Um, it's going to be um, uh, March 25th, which should be a Thursday. And so we're, you know, by that time, we do have some of the artists who are already start is working on parts of, you know, what's going to be in the building. So March 25th is a time to get to you know, meet the artist that's working on, you know, work for this building, to hear a little bit about what they're creating, to hear a little bit about their thought process, their work. Um, so I invite you all to, to join in on that as well. And if you see something posted about the program, please consider resharing it and getting the story out to the community. Uh, this is one evening, but uh, it's definitely something that could be repeated and continued. So um, I'm going to put a little spotlight on our favorite poet, Ms. Rebecca Butterfly, to close us out. Oh, your volume is down. Your, um, your, your mic is off. All right, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. 
I thoroughly enjoyed everyone's story. I literally felt like I was here watching a documentary type movie vibe. I got a little laugh. Um, I felt like I was going to cry a couple of times um, because some stuff, you know, really got deep and sentimental. But just like like everyone else, you know, has been chatting and and commenting, um, Nikki, yes, thank you for this. Thanks to Y for, you know, commissioning you to put this together. Because again, oral history is very, very necessary, as well as important. Because it, it just makes it a little bit more different. And it hits you in your spirit and your soul that when you're walking down a particular street in, a, in the neighborhood, it's not just a regular walk. You know, you're walking in the breeze of history. So as we close out, again, Sankofa, you got to look back so you'll know how to look forward. And yes, it's a beautiful thing when memories can be brought back to the forefront. I listen to everyone and we all have had a one-eyed Nick in our lives wondering how they have made out. It's interesting as I always say that six degrees of separation is really maybe just two degrees. Your story is also my story. It's only different in atmosphere or vibe. See, I'm a 305 baby, but I get a lot of respect and appreciation from the 954 Broward County, that is. And it's always been a pleasure to be a part of the community events. Sis Trunk Festival is always one of my favorites. Just to be in that ambiance and see the little boys and the little girls and the teenagers and the grown women and the elder women and the elder men just caravanning and walking about the streets, but they're stopping off at the different truck stops that are there with food and reminding them and seeing or talking to someone and telling someone who has the best conch salad or who has the best conch fritters or who makes the best barbecue and whose barbecue sauce is just the bomb and needs to be in grocery stores on shelves. See, you never really, really know where you come from until you're told where you come from. And there are a lot of individuals who walk in the midst of the light, but are really still in a particular part of darkness because they don't know who they are. And when you don't know who you are, it's kind of hard to navigate through this thing called life. So therefore, we need to bring things back home. I clung to the lyrics of someone speaking and saying, you know, there's Black-owned businesses. I want to repeat that again. Black-owned businesses. We need that passion to come back so that the legacy can go on and on and on. It hurts me that, of course, when the founder dies, sometimes the business dies, too. But it's a beautiful thing that back in the day, that's just it. You sat around in the house next to grandma or granddaddy's knee, and they told you about the youngsters that they grew up with and what they're doing now and who they are now. It's kind of like when you're watching TV and that show comes on or that football game comes on or that basketball game comes on and granddaddy's telling you, I went to school with his daddy. Me and his grandmama, we were kind of close, that kind of thing. So thank you, as I say again, Nikki and the Y, for coming together to keep history breathing again in Broward County. Sis Trunk must continue its legacy, and it can only be done if the stories are continued to be told. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very good. Yeah, I see a couple of comments. Uh, uh, 
God bless you. Thank you for sharing the story. Yes, so um, this is, concludes the program. Thank you so much, Rebecca Butterfly, for blessing us in the, the beginning and the end. Um, uh, thank you again to everyone who shared a story, everyone who's listening in on Facebook, on Zoom, everyone who's going to watch this, listen to this somewhere in the interwebs. Um, this couldn't be possible without everyone's commitment and intentions and input. So I just want to thank everybody for that space. And um, I see on Facebook, we have Don said, is that the Rebecca Butterfly? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, in the flesh. <laughs> in the flesh, in the flesh. So um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And I'm going to sign off for now. Uh, thank you and good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Rest well, dream big. All right. Good all right. Good night. Good night, Scott. Good night. Good night, Scott. Good night, everybody. Good night, Terry. Good, good night. night. <laughs>